the new identity politics of the left. So uh, here's a simple definition of identity politics from Jonathan Rauch. He, he defines it as political mobilization organized around group characteristics such as race, gender, and sexuality as opposed to party, ideology, or pecuniary interest. Okay, very straightforward definition. And then he adds, in America, this sort of mobilization is not new, unusual, un-American, illegitimate, nefarious, or particularly left-wing. Identity is one of the areas that politics often revolves around. But when we take that simple definition, now we can, we can see what kind of identity politics is actually good and what kind is bad. The good kind is that which in the long run is a centripetal force, and the bad kind is that which in the long run is a centrifugal force. Let me explain. Injustice is centrifugal. It destroys trust and causes righteous anger. Institutionalized racism bakes injustice into the system and sets us up for an eventual explosion. When slavery was written into the US Constitution and into our uh, norms and practices in part of the country, it set us up for the greatest explosion of our history. It was a necessary explosion, but we didn't heal right. Uh, we didn't heal uh, uh, properly afterwards. So when Jim Crow was written into Southern laws, it led to another period of necessary explosions in the 1960s. The civil rights struggle was obviously identity politics, no doubt about that. But it was an effort to fix a mistake, to make us better, to make us stronger as a nation. Look at Martin Luther King's rhetoric. It, it's so clear. This was a campaign to create conditions that would allow national reconciliation. King drew on the moral resources of what sociologists call the American civil religion. <clears throat> he activated our shared identity and values. Quote, when the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note. So he's praising our traditions, praising these noble documents. And of course he wrote, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up and live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. Now, of course, at the time, some people accused King of being divisive. Civil rights and identity politics is, uh, is divisive. It's centrifugal, you might have said back then. But King's speech is arguably our most famous and important speech, certainly one of the most important in our history, precisely because he was able to frame our greatest moral failing as a chance for centripetal redemption. This is what I'm calling the good kind of identity politics. Now, let's contrast King's approach with what we're teaching in universities today. There's a new variant that's swept through the academy in the last 10 or so years. It's called intersectionality. <clears throat> it began in, with a, an essay in 1989 by Kimberly Crenshaw, a law professor at UCLA, who made the very reasonable point that a black woman's experience is not the sum of black people's experience and women's experience. She was a law professor. She analyzed a, a, a legal case in which GM had been acquitted of, of racial prejudice. GM was able to show that it didn't discriminate against blacks. It hired a lot of blacks in factory jobs dominated by men. And it didn't discriminate against women. It hired a lot of women in clerical jobs dominated by whites. So even if GM was innocent of those two kind of explanations, they still didn't hire any black women. And Kimberly Crenshaw pointed this out, and thus was born the idea that you don't just look at main effects, you look at interactions of discriminatory effects. Great idea. What academic could argue that we shouldn't look at interaction effects? So it's a very solid intellectual foundation. But here's the funny thing. You take this theory and you teach it to undergrads, not just once, but in lots and lots of classes. Undergrads memorize diagrams showing matrices of privilege and oppression, because it's not just white privilege causing black oppression and male privilege causing female oppression. It's heterosexual versus LGBT. It's able-bodied versus disabled. It's young versus old, attractive versus unattractive, even fertile versus infertile. Anything that a group has, which is good, or valued, 
is seen as causing oppression to groups or people who don't have it. And a funny thing happens when you steep young people in this way of thinking. Remember, we evolved for tribal warfare. This is our nature. We take to it readily and heartily. So you tell these young people to learn all these binaries. Oh, and by the way, one side of the binary is the good people, and the other is the bad people. <clears throat> well, this is exciting stuff for young people. You're turning on their ancient tribal circuits. You're preparing them for battle. And here's the brilliant move made by intersectionality theorists as the theory developed. All of the binary dimensions of oppression are said to be interlocking and overlapping. America is one giant matrix of oppression, and its victims cannot fight their battles separately. They must all come together to fight their common enemy. They must all come together to fight the straight, white, cisgendered, able-bodied, Christian or Jewish or possibly atheist male. <laughs> and this is why, this is why perceived slights against one victim group call forth protest from all victim groups. Intersectionality is like NATO for social justice activists. <laughs> and Thanks. I, I know there aren't a lot of jokes in this talk. That was the one I was hoping that you'd, you'd laugh at. Oh, okay. Double header. Okay. Okay. But once you see that, now you can understand why do so many campus groups align against Israel? I mean, even the LGBT uh, 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 groups are aligned with the, with the Palestinians against Israel, the most progressive nation in the Middle East. But it makes sense once you see they're all united against the common enemy. Well, this means that on any campus where intersectionality thrives, conflict will be eternal, eternal. There will never be peace on these campuses because you can never eliminate all offense, all microaggressions, and all misunderstandings. This is why the dysfunction, the intimidation, and the violence is most severe at our most progressive universities in the most progressive regions. So where have the troubles been, uh, been most visible and most, most extreme? It's schools such as Yale and Middlebury in New England. And Sam Abrams' research shows that New England is by far the least diverse area for ideology. <laughs> um, it's schools such as Berkeley, Evergreen, and Reed on the West Coast. So New England and the West Coast are over and over again at Heterox Academy. We find that's where the, the, the troubles are the most. Now let me remind you of the educational vision of the founders, this quote from Hirsch. The American experiment is a thoroughly artificial device designed to counterbalance the natural impulses of group suspicions and hatreds. This vast artificial trans-tribal construct is what our founders aimed to achieve. And what are we doing on these college campuses? What is the aim there? It's exactly the opposite of what the founders aimed to achieve. We are trying to inflame, or some of us, some professors, some departments are trying to inflame tribal suspicions and hatreds in order to stimulate anger and activism in order to recruit the students as fighters for the political mission of the professor. The identity politics taught on campus today is entirely different from that of Martin Luther King. It rejects America and American values. It does not speak of forgiveness or reconciliation. As King did, he drew so much from the Christian tradition. That is absent in the current, in the current round. It is a massive centrifugal force, which is now seeping down into high schools, especially progressive private schools. I'm getting so many calls now from, from parents who say that the same problems we're having on college they're now happening in a lot of schools, especially private schools. Today's identity politics has another interesting feature. It teaches the exact opposite of what we think a liberal arts education should be. So when I was at Yale in the 1980s, I was given so many tools for understanding the world. By the time I graduated, I could think about things as a utilitarian or as a Kantian, as a Freudian or a behaviorist as a computer scientist or as a humanist. I was given many lenses to apply to any given question or problem. But what do we do now? Many students are given just one lens, power. Here's your lens, kid. Look at everything through this lens. 
Everything is about power. Every situation is analyzed in terms of the bad people acting to preserve their power and privilege over the good people. This is not an education. This is an induction into a cult. It's a fundamentalist religion. It's a paranoid worldview that separates people from each other and sends them down the road to alienation, anxiety, and intellectual impotence. Here's how one young queer activist described the cult uh, in a really fascinating essay in which he, it, he titled it, Everything is Problematic, My Journey into the Center of a Dark Political World and How I Escaped. Okay, so that's the title. If you Google that, you'll find a fascinating essay. And the author identifies four features of this culture, this activist culture. Dogmatism, groupthink, a crusader mentality, and anti-intellectualism. And of greatest interest to us, given the framework I'm giving you about the centripetal and centrifugal forces, um, is what he says about tribalism. He says, thinking this way quickly divides the world into an in-group and an out-group, believers and heathens, the righteous and the wrongchess, he spells it. Um, Every minor heresy inches you further away from the group. When I was part of, of groups like this, Everyone was on exactly the same page about a suspiciously large range of issues. Internal disagreement was rare. Can you imagine, can you imagine, can you invent a culture, a morality, more incompatible with a university education than that one? So let's return to Jefferson's vision. For here we are not afraid to follow the truth wherever it may lead, nor to tolerate any error as long as reason is left free to combat it. Well, if Jefferson were to return today and tour our nation's top universities, he would be shocked at the culture of fear, the tolerance of error, and the shackles placed on reason.